taxpayer dollars to ask the Ukrainians to help them cheat. Politics is a full contact sport where any slip of the tongue, no matter how small, can grow into a massive scandal and sometimes end a career. Oops. Was a politician misheard, misunderstood, or did they just say something flat out crazy? And then we're going to Washington DC to take back the White House! Yeah! Today we'll take a look at the 10 biggest political gaffes in American politics. What are your favorite political gaffes of all time? Let us know in the comments. Number 10, Hillary Clinton's Russia Reset. In 2009, Hillary Clinton became the Secretary of State under President Barack Obama. The relationship at the time between the US and Russia was strange to say the least. So she attempted to quote, reset the relationship with a red button that literally had the word reset printed on it in English and Russian. I wanted to uh, present you with uh, a little gift which represents what President Obama and Vice President Biden and I have been saying. And that is, we want to reset our relationship. And let's do it, let's do it together. So we will do it together. However, there was a problem that made the relationship with Russia even worse. We worked hard to get the right Russian word. Do you think you, we got it? You get it wrong. I got it wrong. Ah. It should be Perezagruska. Ah. And this says uh, Peregruska, which means overcharged. <laughs> 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 President Trump commented on the effect of Hillary's Russia reset in a 2017 press conference. Hillary Clinton did a reset, remember, with the stupid plastic button that made us all look like a bunch of jerks? Here, take a look. He looked at her like, what the hell is she doing? <laughs> Number nine, Kamala Harris's favorite rapper. During a 2020 campaign interview, Kamala Harris was asked to name her favorite rapper who's alive. Best rapper alive. Tupac. <laughs> Kamala. Um, Tupac is dead. Tupac has been dead since 1996, allegedly. That moment is similar to her appearance on the Breakfast Club radio show. During that interview, Kamala said that she listened to Tupac and Snoop Dogg in college while smoking weed. Have you ever smoked? I have. Okay. Like and I, I, and I inhaled. I did, in, I did, did inhale. inhale. <laughs> what were you What's listening to when you was high? Uh, <laughs> what was on? What song was on? Oh Snoop? my goodness. Oh yeah, definitely Snoop. Uh-huh. Uh, Tupac, Tupac, for sure. Kamala, I know you just want to be relatable. You just want to be one of the cool kids. But the problem here is that neither artist had made any music at the time that you were in college. <laughs> <laughs> Number eight, Gary Johnson's foreign policy fail. I was waiting for this one to be on the list because this is one of my all-time favorites. In 2016, Libertarian presidential candidate Gary Johnson appeared on MSNBC and he was asked what he would do about the Syrian refugee crisis raging in the city of Aleppo, the nation's capital. What would you do if you were elected about Aleppo? About Aleppo. And what is Aleppo? You're kidding. No. Aleppo is in Syria. It's the, uh, it's the epicenter of the refugee crisis. Okay, got it, got it. Now, to be fair, Gary was an open libertarian and a big part of that is not getting involved in foreign conflicts, keeping things focused on America. But if you're running for president, you should probably know that. Number seven on our list is the Department of, uh, uh, uh I'll, I'll think of it. In 2011, at a Republican primary debate, Texas Governor Rick Perry promised that he would shrink the size of government. The governor was, ambitious in his plans. He wasn't just gonna cut spending, he promised to actually abolish three entire departments of the federal government. But there was only one problem. He couldn't remember which departments he actually planned to get rid of. It's three agencies of government when I get there that are gone. Commerce, education, and the, uh, uh, what's the third one there? Let's see. <laughs> you need five. Oh, five, yeah, okay. So five. commerce, education, and uh, the... Um, uh, uh, EPA? Oh, EPA, there you go. No, okay. Let, let's talk, let's talk deposition. Seriously? No, at first, Perry tried to move on and leave the embarrassing moment behind, but debate moderator John Harwood wasn't about to let that happen, which is something we're thankful for on this list. Is EPA the one you were talking about? Or? No, sir. No, sir. We were talking about the um, agencies of government. EPA needs to be rebuilt. But There's you no can't, doubt about but that. But you can't name the third one? The third agency of government, yeah. I, would, I would do away with the education, uh, the uh, <laughs> commerce. I, I, commerce, and let's see. Oh I can't. The third one, I can't. Sorry. <laughs> 
Oops. Comedians had a field day with the slip up. Oh, what's the third one there? Uh, <laughs> it's got away from me. <laughs> Oops. It wasn't the end of Perry's career, however. He went on to lead the Department of, uh, the, the Department of, uh, Energy. The Department of Energy under President Trump. That is a bounce back. Good for you, Rick Perry. Number six. Amy Klobuchar's hair joke. In 2019, Amy Klobuchar launched her campaign for Democrat nomination in Minnesota. During her speech, she talked about the perils of global warming as the snow fell around her. Donald Trump took note of that contrast and tweeted saying, quote, by the end of her speech, she looked like a snow woman. Amy, not one to miss out on a moment for a good solid joke. Thought up what I'm sure in her head was a brilliant response to Trump. The president actually sent out a tweet. He made fun of me for talking about climate change in the middle of a blizzard, and he called me Snow Woman. So I wrote back, hey, Donald Trump, the science is on my side, and I'd like to see how your hair would fare in a blizzard. What really solidified this horrible joke in the Fails Hall of Fame is the fact that she kept telling that story over and over and over again. So I wrote back, hey, Donald Trump, the science is on my side, and I'd like to see how your hair would fare in a blizzard. So I wrote back, Donald Trump, the science is on my side, and I'd like to see how your hair would fare in a blizzard. I wrote back on Twitter, I'd like to see how your hair would fare in a blizzard. So I wrote back, hey, Donald Trump. So I wrote back, uh, hey, Donald Trump. So I wrote back, I wrote back. I tweeted back, the, the science, science is on, on my, my side. side. And I'd like to see and how I'd your like hair would fare how and I'd like to see how your hair would fare in a Number five, George Bush fools himself. In 2002, President Bush was giving a speech about, of all things, education in Tennessee when he made a very memorable mistake. There's an old saying in Tennessee, I know it's in Texas, probably in Tennessee, that says, fool me once, shame on, shame on you. It fooled me, we can't get fooled again. Rumor has it that if you listen closely to this day, you can still hear George W. Bush trying to get that phrase right all the way from Texas. In fourth place is the time President Obama forgot how many states there are. During the 2008 presidential campaign, Barack Obama told a crowd in Oregon how proud he was that he had visited nearly every state in the country. All 50, or, well, I guess maybe there were more. It is just wonderful to be back in Oregon, and over the last 15 months, we've traveled uh, to every corner of the United States. Uh, I've now been in 57 states, I think one left to go. Uh, one left to go. Uh, Alaska and Hawaii I was not allowed to go to, even though I really wanted to visit, but my staff would not uh, justify it. You can tell the audience is like waiting for a punchline, but there isn't one. And he's already been to 57 states, and he has just one more to go, which means I guess Alaska and Hawaii only count as one. Number three, Senator Cory Booker and his Spartacus moment. In 2018, Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh was going through confirmation hearings and during hours of questioning. During the process, senators such as Cory Booker are permitted to review the nominee's private documents in a secure setting. Booker, however, decided to unilaterally leak one of Brett Kavanaugh's old emails to the press. So stunning and brave. And, and I could not understand, and I violated this rule knowingly, why, why these issues should be withheld from the public. Now, I appreciate the comments of my colleagues. This is about the closest I'll probably ever have in my life to an I am Spartacus moment. I am Spartacus! Daily Wire's Ben Shapiro had his own idea for what Corey's nickname should be instead of Spartacus. There will be a tweet from President Trump about Cory Booker. I am pushing all of my friends at the White House to get the president to nickname him Farticus. I just think that the alternatives are crying Corey. Uh, there's also drama queen Corey. There, there, are few, there are a few possibilities, but I think Farticus is clearly the best. Coming in at number two, former President Donald J. Trump and his propensity for more than a couple name mix-ups from people to countries. The towns. Chuck Grassley was there, and Joni Ernst, and uh, John Thune, and Mike Pounds. We appreciate it very much, Tim Apple. Mr. President, Marilyn Houston, Lockheed Martin. Marilyn Lockheed. Mike Bolton, as you know, is in Russia. Mike Bolton, John Bolton is here. Ethiopia, Ghana, Guinea, Nambia. When they gaze upon Yosemites, Yosemites, towering 
sequoias. What we just saw, we just left pleasure. Paradise. 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 Yeah. For paradise. As the great religious teacher Swami Vive Kamunund once said. So we don't make mistakes. Go ahead, Ken. Um, Chuck Canterbury. And then there are the moments when Trump intentionally gets a name wrong, which, spoiler alert, you don't want that to happen. If it just slips your mind, that's one thing. But if he comes up with a special name for you, it might sound a little bit like this. The President of the United States referred to a congressman as Little Adam Shit. <laughs> and at number one is pretty much every time Joe Biden opens his mouth. Joe Biden has been called a walking gaffe machine because he generates a new catastrophic blender on an almost daily basis. It's basically a full-time job for this guy. You ever been to a caucus? No, you haven't. You're a line dog faced pony soldier. You said you were, but you're, you're... And then there are times when Joe gets a little heated. You're a damn liar, man. You're full of shit. You said I set up my son to work in an oil company. Isn't that what you said? I Get your word straight, Jack. All right, thank now, you. Now, now, shush. And there are other times Biden says things that just make you wonder, what is happening in your brain right now, Joe? We hold these truths to be self-evident. All men and women created by the go, you know the you know the thing. We choose truth over facts. Seven hundred billion and a trillion three hundred million billion dollars. I'll lead an effective strategy to mobilize true and international effort to pressure. Why, 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 why? You're getting nervous, man. I want to be clear. I'm not going nuts. And then there's Joe Biden's deep and insightful commentary on race in America. We have this notion that somehow if you're poor, you cannot do it. Poor kids are just as bright and just as talented as white kids. You cannot go to a 7-Eleven or a Dunkin' Donuts unless you have a slight Indian accent. We're working to build relations with the East, with the East African uh, um, immigrants. I might add, if you ever come to the train station with me, you'll notice that uh, I have great relations with them because there's an awful lot of driving cabs. Unchain Wall Street. They're going to put you all back in chains. I mean, you got the first sort of mainstream African American yeah. who is articulate and bright and, and, and clean and nice looking guy. I mean, it's, that's a storybook, man. And I tell you, if you have a problem figuring out whether you're for me or Trump, then you ain't black. And then, of course, there are times when Joe says things that just get, well, they get pretty creepy. I got a lot of, I got hairy legs that turn, that, 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 that turn uh, um, blonde in the sun. And the kids used to come up and reach in the pool and rub my leg down so it was straight and then watch the hair come back up again. They look at it. So I learned about roaches. I learned about kids jumping on my lap. And I've loved kids jumping on my lap. And confidence. Got a lot of thanks to you. <laughs> Look at her. She looks like she's 19 years old, sitting there with her, like a little lady in a race car. How old are you, honey? You're 11 years old. Talk to me before we leave, okay? I mean, come on. Where do you even go from there? That's got to be the last one, right? And no, it's not. Okay, there's one more. Just get it over with. Put me out of my misery. And I also am told that uh, that uh, uh, Chuck Graham, state senator, is here. Chuck. Stand up, Chuck. Let him see you. Oh, God love you. What am I talking about? I tell you what, you're making everybody else stand up, though, pal. Thank you very, very much. I tell you what, stand up for Chuck. We hope you enjoyed this wild ride as we counted down the 10 biggest political gaps in history. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to this YouTube channel. I'm Cabot Phillips with The Daily Wire. Thanks for watching. For all the stuff about gaps, I don't think there are many real gaps. Oh, I never make any big, big gaps.